So, good evening, everybody. Uh, we started our today uh, webinar. Uh, we have two lectures. The first will be presented by Professor Lawrence Lenhart, and the second uh, thereafter by Rose Gu. Uh, Professor Lenhart is the chief of the thyroid and endocrine tumor unit at the PTA Salpetriere Hospital, Paris, France. She is certified professor of endocrinology at Sorbonne University. She manages patients with thyroid disease and thyroid cancer, imaging, FNA, and radioionine therapy. She is investigator in protocols for refractory thyroid cancer. She develops thermoablation of thyroid nodules. She contributed to setting up ETA and national guidelines on thyroid nodules, cancer, and ultrasonography. So let me ask you, Lawrence, please hold your presentation. Uh, you first, I, I uh, unmute everybody. Yeah. Mute everybody, yes. And now, please, Lawrence, unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thomas Solimozy, for your kind invitation. My lecture is about the neck compartments and their importance. Uh, as you know, cervical lymph node metast metastasis are common in patients with thyroid differentiated thyroid cancer. And uh, the aim of this lecture is to improve our knowledge regarding the description of this compartment at three levels, anatomical one, surgical one, and ultrasonographic one. It's very important and it's a challenge for the surgeon to be able to suggest or indicate lymph node dissection in a compartment well described. So, uh, I would like to have the next. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, and I would like to thank Gilles Rus for its, his iconography. And my lecture could be summarized in 12 take home messages indicated by this young woman. So, my talk will be divided into two parts. The first one describes the neck compartments through three consensus that have been updated regularly. And the original one is from Robbins in 1998. And then after, the consensus from Caddy, the consensus from Stax, and the last one from the ETA dedicated to ultrasonographists. And then in the second part, of my talk, I will highlight the importance of this compartment. The rational and background will be described. And then we go one step further, analyzing together technical standards, standardization of ultrasound reports, and we will assess neck lymph nodes and thyroid bed together. So this is the original anatomic diagram of the neck de depicting the boundaries of the six next levels and three next sublevels. You can see nodal level one, midline above sorry bed, one A and one B. The level two, right and left, is lateral to the common carotid artery upper neck. The level three, right and left lateral to common carotid artery mid-neck, the level five, that is a spinal one, right and left, lateral to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the sector six, which is the central one, 
medial to the common carry artery thyroid bed clavicle. So we will, of course, uh, go into the details of these different compartments. Here, there, is more, uh, there are more details regarding these compartments, and I put in red the compartment 2, upper jugular group in 2A and 2B, the level 3, middle jugular group, Level 4 with the 4A lower jugular group and 4B medial supraclavicular group. The spinal compartment, posterior triangle group, with divided into 5A and 5B. And the sixth one is the central one, anterior compartment group. And of course, the seventh one is the prevertebral compartment group with its different parts at the top of the manubrium. You can see some anatomical boundaries very important, lower border of hyoid bone, lower margin of cricoid cartilage, and left common carotid artery. And here, the posterior boundary of submandibular gland. And you see in the next slide that in the first consensus, in the second one from Robbins, uh, this consensus allow radiologists to localize nodal lesion within the defined level of the neck, and the consensus try to standardize the terminology of neck dissection and make new recommendations regarding the boundaries between level 1 and 2 and between level 3, 4, and 6. And we will see these two boundaries in the next two slides. The hyoid bone is the boundary between level 2 and 3 here, yeah. and the, the cricoid cartilage is the boundary between level 3 and 4. When Robbins redefined the boundary between sublevel 1b and 2a, Robbins proposed an alternative border between these two levels, defined by the vertical plane defined by the posterior edge of the submandibular gland. So this is the definition of the boundary between 1B and 2A. The second point of this consensus was the radiologic landmark to separate levels 3 and 4, 3 and 4 from level 6. The anatomic boundary normally is the lateral border of the sternohyoid muscle. This is not a landmark that radiologists can discern easily. So the recommendation is that the medial aspect of the common carotid artery is an acceptable landmark for separating these two levels. Then in the next consensus from Carty, it was done with uh, different American thyroid association and uh, of course surgeon and otolaryngology head and neck surgery. And the goals of this, of this consensus focused on the central compartment, very important for the surgeon. The goals was to review the relevant anatomy of this compartment, to identify the nodal subgroup within the central compartment that are frequently involved in thyroid cancer, and to define a consistent terminology relevant to the central compartment. And Carty published this schematic right anterior oblique view, indicating the level of the next and upper mediastinal relevant to neck dissection. So this one is very important for the surgeon. The central compartment is referred to as level six. And the superior the hyoid bone and lateral carotid artery, central compartment boundaries are easily recognized. The inferior bone has been defined as a sternal notch or the innominate brachiocephalic artery. But if you use the innominate brachiocephalic artery as the lower border, that implies the inclusion of the anterior superior mediastinum above the innominate artery and sometimes it's referred to as level 7. So you can use the level 7, but you must, you sh you must know that you are at the uh, lower part of the compartment, 6 called 7. 
In this anterior view of the neck, it is indicate the boundaries of the central neck compartment. Here you have the hyoid bone, the common carotid artery, and here you have the parasaurid gland, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, you see here, and the central neck compartment is bounded superiorly by the hyoid bone, laterally by the carotid artery, and anteriorly by the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia, and posteriorly by the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. And it's very useful to use this diagram when you decided to operate it or to make a central neck dissection. This slide details the anterior view of the central neck compartment, and this slide indicates locations of lymph node basins relevant to central neck dissection for thyroid carcinoma. And the most commonly involved central lymph node are the prelaryngeal, the alphian, this one, that are pretrachoidian, the pretracheal, and the right and left paratracheal nodes, here on the right and on the left. Then we move on a more recent consensus uh, published by Stacks from the American Thyroid Association, where the, in which the goal of the study were to identify methods for determining metastatic DTC in the lateral neck and especially to address the extent of lymph node dissection for the lateral neck. And it's more, it's a consensus more clinical and stacks outline the parameters which affects presence of lateral nodes disease in differentiated thyroid cancer, such as primary size of the tumor, the age, the presence of a thyroid capsular invasion, the central neck disease, the type of neck dissection, etc., the recurrence, the multifocality of the, of the primary tumor, uh, if it's a follicular thyroid cancer or a herbal cell cancer, etc. And so uh, he, remind, uh, all, he re uh, also remind that the, the preoperative high resolution ultrasound examination of the thyroid lobe and the cervical lymph nodes is really needed. Uh, it is the standard for all patients undergoing thyroid surgery for malignant cyto cytology. And uh, it's the first consensus that puts together the nodal level, the anatomical landmark, and the transducer that is recommended to detect the lymph nodes. So you see that you need a transducer with a high uh, frequency linear probe, and uh, here you have the anatomical landmark that we have described previously. And then, in Europe, we draw this diagram with a, um, a team of friends, and uh, we decided to show the lateral compartment and the central one, and we publish this uh, uh, diagram that, that show the separation between level two and three, that is the division of the carotid artery into two branches, and the level three is above the homohyoid muscle, and the level four below it, under the level three, and the level five outside the common carotid artery and the uh, muscle. Here is the homohyoid muscle that you will see on this short video. Here, you can see here the homohyoid muscle. So now you are under these, uh, these muscles, so are, you are in compartment four, and before you were in the compartment three. So now let us move on to the second part of my lecture, the neck compartment and their importance. So, I will share with you the rationale and the background, the technical standards, the standardization of ultrasound reporting, 
the assessment of neck lymph nodes and of thyroid bed. Here, just to remind that at initial treatment, treatment, there is a very interesting relationship between the size of the carcinoma, the presence of an extracellular extension, and the presence of nerve node meds. And you see that for very small tumor, such as less than five millimeters, there is few uh, lymph nodes metastasis and few extracellular extension. And the larger the tumor, the wider the tumor is spread. And so you can hear in dotted line the extracellular invasion and in lymph node, in the um, bold one, lymph node meds. And when you do ultrasound in routine, you should have in the other hand, in one hand the probe and the other hand the surgical histopathological report to remember where was the tumor, where, what was her, its size, is there a multifocality, is there an extracellular invasion, um, and the surgical mar margin, were they positive or negative, and of course the number of lymph nodes examined, the number of lymph nodes with tumor, and the ratio between the the exit lymph node with METS on the, percent, the number of lymph nodes uh, exist. And of course, if there is an extra nodal invasion. And during follow-up, it's very important to be confident with the exam ultrasound examination of the neck compartments because your goal is to detect recurrence. Uh, as you know, the risk of structural disease recurrence is based, of course, of the updated PTNM classification, but also at variable at initial treatment, such as thyroglobulin level and ultrasonography at a postoperative stage. And uh, American Thyroid Association has uh, uh, suggest a score for stratification with a low intermediate or high risk level for recurrence based on the importance of the lymph node uh, invasion, the extracellular extension, and the histological type. So you can see that um, according to the size of the, uh, the number of the lymph nodes, you have, you, the patient could be at low intermediate or high risk. And uh, the second um, the second uh, L, um, point to have to keep in mind is the response to initial treatment. So, ultrasonographist, you you will be here to try to detect the persistence or the recurrence of the lymph nodes in this group of patients that correspond to incomplete structural response about 28% of patients after initial treatment. Because the recurrence are located, uh, occurs in five to 20% of cases, and they occur in, uh, generally in the first five to seven years, and, and, they and they depend on the PTNA stage. And you can see here, generally, Recurrence are located in leg lymph nodes in 75% of cases, but recurrence can be also localized in the thyroid bed. You can see in here the trachea, the carotid, the jugular vein, and here the recurrence, but also in soft tissue in the anterior part of the thyroid bed. So what are the what are the technical standards uh, recommended for uh, such examination? You need a high frequency linear probe, at least 12 megahertz with a footprint of 3.5 centimeter or more, and the probe should have variable frequency settings so that lower frequencies can be used for deep field examination and especially for. Um, analyzing uh, deep field located uh, structure. 
A small sector of convex transistor with variable frequency is useful for the sector 7. And regarding color flow or power Doppler examination, uh, it's interesting to have a low pulse repetition frequency or less and low wall filter to optimize, optimize the detection of, for example, low flow vascularity in small lymph nets for for a better uh, view of, uh, the, of the hilum, for example. And the patient's necks should be extended into neutral position, and he can turn the, uh, the head to the side to have a better evaluation of the tracheoesophageal growth. And lateral and central cervical compartments should be evaluated in the transverse plane, and all, all any abnormalities should be imaged in the longitudinal plane and assessed also by Doppler. And you scan in the transverse plane from the upper part of the neck to the clavicles, and you should include the examination of level 2 to 6. And you cannot scan um, this, uh, all the re different regions together. So you need to scan separately central level from the top to the bottom, level A to, to A to 4, and then after level 5. And also you can, the probe can then be angled inferiorly in the sternal notch to assess the sector of 7. So then after, you draw, you draw the knots that you see on the diagram. The ultrasound report should document the thyroid bed, remnants, the description of abnormal lesion, size, uh, shape, um, three dimension, uh, echogenicity, presence of micro calcification, etc. And in all lymph node compartments, you should describe any undeterminate or suspicious lymph node. It's not necessary to put on the draw on the diagram the normal lymph node next, the lymph nodes. And uh, we suggest when we publish the ATA recommendation. Uh, that the ultrasonographies uh, should be experienced in recognizing lymph nodes, and we suggest training about 100 examinations per year or more than six, 600 examinations per year. Now, to assess lymph node, we must keep in mind that the lymphatic fluid is drained through the lymphatic vessels, which drain into lymph nodes, and one of the most important is that uh, the lymphatic flows go through the cortex and the medulla and exits through the hilum. And so the tumoral proliferation begins in the marginal sinus and then go into the, uh, the lymph nodes and exits through the hilum. So the first step of the invasion is the grade one, and you can see only uh, a power, um, a signal Doppler in the periphery of the lymph nodes, and then after the grade two, and then the grade three, where the hilum is destroyed, and you see anarchic vascularization, such as this uh, uh, picture where you see uh, the peripheral flow. Here it's a grade two, and then here it's a grade three with peripheral, but also. Um, Doppler flow inside the lymph node. So when you want to assess neck lymph nodes, with eight ultrasound, a criteria must be assessed. The size, of course, the shape, the echogenicity, the hilum, the cystic appearance, the presence of hyperechoic punctuations, and the distribution of the vascularization and also the fact that the lymph node looks like normal thyroid tissue. You can see here normal thyroid tissue. It's the lymph nodes, probably perhaps two that are closed, but this one is more hypoechoic, and this one is a uh, mimics uh, thyroid gland. And uh, the guide, the Epirven Thyroid Association guidelines divided the lymph node uh, classification into three groups. The normal one, we have a normal that have a normal island, a novoid shape, and the absence or high vascularization. 
you can see here a normal lymph nodes. In the undeterminate uh, group, the lymph nodes have no hilum and have a, at least one of the following signs, round shape, increased short axis, and increased central vascularization. And in the suspicious group of lymph nodes, only one criteria is enough to classify your lymph node in a malignant one. That is my, the presence of microcalcification, the presence of cystic area inside the lymph node, or an hyperichoic tissue that looks like thyroid, or a peripheral or diffuse increased vascularization. And then you put on the you draw in the diagram the lymph node as you have seen the blue one you can draw if you want but especially the green one that are intermediate the suspicious one in red and if you see for example small lymphocella liquid one in dark in black and in gray solid structure that can correspond to a clip, a surgical clip, or a granuloma. So, what are you seeing about these lymph nodes? You can see that the flow, the Doppler flow, uh, Doppler flow is, is peripheral, and it corresponds to a lymph node METS. This one also is very interesting because it looks like thyroid tissue here. You can see here some pathological microcalcification and also here a small zone of cystization. About the indeterminate neck lymph node, the criteria must take into account the stage of histology, the size of lymph nodes and the compartment where they are. For example, an increased short axis more than five in sector three is suspicious and more than seven in sector two is suspicious because generally the lymph node in sector two are larger than the lymph node in sector three. And so the love asylum and at least one of the following signs, round shape, increased short axis or increased central vascularization are enough to classify this lymph node or in the indeterminate group. And then the criteria for benign lymph nodes, the presence of hilum, the long, the flat aspect, the um, longer on shorter ratio more than two, and neither microclassification, nor cystization, and well vascular hyzum. There is no indication for cytology in such uh, patterns of lymph nodes. Now, let us move on to the assessment of thyroid bed. You can see here a pitfall that is the esophagus, and here you can see the thyroid bed that is perfectly normal, the carotid and the jugular, and you can see the muscle are uh, here. And in this, uh, uh, you can have the this hyperichoic area, but you can also, uh, especially on the right level, the carotid close to the trachea, that is the internalization of the carotid and jugular axis. In suspicious thyroid bed, such, on this, uh, such as on this slide, you can see a vascularized hypoechoic mass. There is no cystization in this picture and no calcification, but the shape and the hypoechogenicity is enough to classify this mass in suspicious thyroid bed mass. Here you can see a recurrence in thyroid bed. You can see here the right thyroid bed with this, uh, with this nodule that is hypoechoic. This one also with uh, anarchic vascularization. This one also in the um, left thyroid uh, bed, which is here, is uh, that need that require uh, FNA. 
And most important for the surgeon is to draw on a diagram the lymph node and pat the pathological lymph node that you have exam seen. And for, for example, these patients with a very important recurrence of differentiated thyroid cancer, you can see here the diagram before going to the surgeon. So, this uh, stratification of neck lesion done by the uh, parent thyroid association uh, has been tested uh, by different publications, and especially I would like to remind you the paper from La Martina, and uh, her objective was to assess the ETA classification and see if this classification was able to predict the growth and persistence of ultrasound neck lesion. So she included a cohort of, uh, 80, of 58 patients uh, among a large cohort of DTC, and uh, the patients have thyro total thyroidectomy, neck dissection, radioiodine, and two abnormal ultrasound findings. The median follow-up was more than three years. More than 100 lesions were follow-up, divided into two groups, indeterminate group E, I, and suspicious one. And the percentage of lesion that grows was 8% in the undeterminate group versus 36% in the suspicious group. And this uh, classification was done, of course, uh, thanks to the ETA classification. And so they conclude that the ETA classification can help to identify papillary thyroid cancer patients eligible for more relaxed follow-up, especially the patient who has intermediate uh, lesions seen at ultrasonography and that uh, will not progress over time. This other paper uh, published the fact that suspicious cervical lymph nodes detect after thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid cancer usually remain stable over years in properly selected patients. And so there is no um, there is no emergency to uh, reoperate such patients, and sometimes the best uh, things to do is to wait and see. And I would like to uh, end my talk on two slides with two slides. This slides this study from Banerjee. He demonstrated that the use of imaging tests after primary treatment of thyroid cancer is really impressive because here you can see the imaging test and the, the use, the increasing use of this test. The disease specific mortalities that does not change over time and no, the diagnosis also does not change. And so you use, there is a rise in incident cancer imaging, but there is no change in death rates. And they study and they see, they publish that the neck ultrasonography, radioiodine, and PET scan are, were associated with treatment for recurrence, of course. But they, no, they did not change the survival. And only the use of radioiodine scan, you know, the whole body scan that you do after radioiodine treatment, only the use of radioiodine scan was associated with improved disease specific survival. So we need to stop over diagnosis, not to use too many tests, and fight against the technological construction of the disease. And this is another paper from Hoffman, and he demonstrated that when you have a very improved and very impressive and the last model of the uh, ultrasonographic machine, for example, a very exciting one, very new one, very expensive one, you will increase accuracy, sensitivity, specificity of your examination, so you will detect more cases, and you, you call the patient one year after to uh, do again an ultrasonography, and you shift in disease spectrum towards milder form of disease and pseudo disease, especially when you follow up very small structure in the neck compartments. 
So, of course, the outcome is excellent. You have more survival, you are successful, you have more catch up, more investments, and you, <laughs> and you uh, have, of course, technical improved tests. So, be careful uh, and fight against the technological construction of the disease, especially uh, in ultrasonographic field. Then, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laurence, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I was always afraid about neck compartments, uh, and uh, I learned much, much from your lecture, and I pay the attention of the attendants that your lecture will be available uh, till 10 days, so till the next Sunday. So if uh, somebody wants to review your lecture, you have the opportunity for 10 days to do this. And, and I highly advise this. I will uh, make this at least one more. So please, questions. Please unmute first if you have any questions. Lawrence, may I ask you a question? Please. Sometimes post-surgery we have the detectable thyroglobulin and they increase us and every time the clinician sent for us ultrasound scan we don't find anything what is your protocol in your institution what would you do with an increasing thyroglobulin it depends on the level and uh, generally we do um, a CT scan uh, to check the lungs and then if you have micro nodules in the lung we suggest a second radio island treatment if the TG level is more than 10 or is increasing if you the TG level increase from 4 to 8 it's not necessary to wait for 10 mm -hmm. we treat if the the slope is uh, increasing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Until the next question, I have one. Uh, did uh, cause any change the new? DNM classification system regarding this, uh, regarding the handling of the neck compartments. So uh, the minimal invasive uh, uh, extension was downgraded. So many formerly stage uh, three and two uh, cancers were downgraded to stage one. And uh, uh, the second part of my question is that the age limit uh, uh, was previously. 40 years and now 50 years. So a page under the age of 50 uh, belongs in almost all cases uh, to stage one, except for distant metastasis. So has uh, this change in TNM system any relevance for uh, uh, the topic which you have discussed, Laurence? The PTNM classification updated in 2017 is correlated to deaths and specific mortality, but not to recurrence. And so, including a small extracidal extension into PT1 or PT2 and suppressed PT3 in the other classification, there is no impact on survival. It can be, it can have an impact on the recurrence and uh, Classification of the American Sire Association classify patients in high, intermediate, or low risk of recurrence, but not of death. And so, I think that the most important for the surgeon is to be confident in the localization of the recurrence or the persistence and to have a good diagram because patients who present lymph node involvement 
about 20% of them at initial treatment will have persistence. And so this persistence should be reevaluated and draw on a diagram before discussing with the surgeon if a new lymph node dissection is required or not. And so I think that uh, the multifocality, the, the type of the invasion of lymph nodes, the size of the lymph nodes, the, ex the existence of an extra capsular uh, extension of the lymph nodes are very important main factors to, um, for uh, exposing the patient to recurrence. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. So one thing is the death, and the other is the clinical presentation. Okay, other questions? If not, thank you very much once more for this uh, excellent presentation, Laurence, uh, and we turn now uh, to our second uh, event, second part of the, our uh, current event. Uh, Ro uh, Rose Gu will uh, discuss about other stru structures in the neck, other means not thyroid, not parathyroid, and not lymph node. Naturally, uh, uh, the lymph node uh, cannot be excluded from this presentation, at least from a differential diagnostic aspect, I think. Rose Gu is a consultant uh, uh, of maxifo, max, maxillofacial radiologist working at Guys and St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust, uh, the London Bridge Hospital and the Portland Hospital London. She is a member of the Guys and uh, St. Thomas and the London Bridge Hospital multidisciplinary head, neck and thyroid oncology teams, which provide cancer service for South East London and the tertiary service for complex head and neck oncology and thyroid management. She has a dedicated ultrasound practice and final respiration clinics with rapid on-site evaluation with consultant cytopathologists and provide over 1,000 FNA per year. She was the first radiologist to set up a combined ultrasound and cytology clinic at the Guy's Hospital in 2007 and then 2010 at the London Bridge Hospital. She is the co-author of uh, various guidelines, including uh, the ETA targets uh, paper. Please, Rose, present your lecture. First, uh, I unmute, uh, I mute again everybody. Okay. Thank I'm you very done. much. Okay, please, Rose. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I know it's late, it's a long day. Um, I'm presenting the lumps and bumps of the head and neck and the other bits that's not thyroid, but here we go. So this is where I work. I'm sitting now on uh, in this building on the 23rd floor. We're next to the shot, which is, I don't know whether it's still the tallest in, in Europe, but there we go. And um, I've got nothing to declare. Uh, what I like to bring to you today is a systematic ultrasound scanning of the neck to show you how I do it, uh, level of the head and neck, which Lawrence has described beautifully. So we like to re-emphasize that. Uh, common findings are the lumps and bumps that you might find in the various level of the neck and the significance of what you find. So now a lot of people don't tell you this, but it's really important if you perform a lot of ultrasound every year, every day, it's important that you have you sit in a good position because you can wear yourself out very, very quickly. Um, and very importantly, I, I scan behind the patient because we are interested only in the head and neck. And it's marvelous position because you keep your arm close to your body and therefore you're not stretching your arm out and that therefore you hopefully won't hurt your shoulder. So really important to see how you sit where your patients sit and that you can see the screen. It's so important when you do an FNA because you want the screen in front of you, as you could see here. Now, a, a simple tip as well, as you all know, when you pick up a probe, choose the right probe for the right procedure. 
And each probe, you know uh, where the, the probe is angulated, make sure it's always to the right of the patient and test it before you put the probe down because it's so easy to twist the probe, probe the other way around and what is should be the right of the patient become the left. Simple, simple things, just like that. And when you scan a patient, it's worth to be 90 degree to the skin so you get the best image and scan with a steady hand. George Clooney, everybody knows him. So what's the problem when he when somebody comes with facial hair? Yeah, should have shown, sorry. So if he comes with a facial hair, which I'm so sorry, it didn't show, but you could see this is the problem. Uh, this is what it will cause to your, to your image. You can't see it very well. So it's nice if the patient can shave, but if not, you're going to need to use quite a lot of gel. And this was a patient, the same patient, and we use a lot of gel and you could still see the shadowing down onto the image. So I'm trying to move on. Lawrence has shown a beautiful um, diagram of the head and neck. This is a simplified version. Uh, I use the AJCC. This is a simplified one. I do use the one that Lawrence showed. And we break the neck up into uh, six um, sections. And I'm going to show you how I do it. It's called the seven sweeps of the neck. Very, very simple. It goes from the submental region uh, underneath here. I like to go all the way down to level six so you don't miss between level one and six all the way down, especially if you've got a small thorough glossal duct cyst there. You want to scan all the way down to the sternal notch and then you pick the probe up again and go from 1A to 1B up to level two to the protit all the way down the neck, two, three and four. And then you're coming back up level five, you're going to cover five B and coming all the way up to five, uh, five A at the top. Okay, sorry, there we go. Go all the way up. So that's how you do the seven sweep. It's systematic and you won't miss anything. When it comes to reporting, it's so so important that you could see here on this diagram. I use a body mark. You can write an annotation down. No matter how you do it, make sure you do it. Make sure you show people or the clinician uh, exactly where you found the lump. It's really important, uh, especially when it comes to lymph node. As, as Lawrence has shown you, they use a map. They draw it on a map. For us here, we tend to, to uh, look through images and we go by the annotation and the body mark. Always remember the probe must be correctly orientated because if not, your right will become your left, your left will become your right and everybody get confused and the surgeons will not be able to find the node that you suggested exists. In the reporting, Lawrence has gone through what you need to do. It's important to put down the site, the size, the shape, the echo texture, the outline, the vascularity, its relationship to the surrounding structure. Okay, so the principle of scanning, it's very simple. We're going from superficial to deep. The problem with an ultrasound is you can only see a little bite size at a time. So you need to make sure you capture what you need to capture. And therefore, the annotation is important. The anatomy is really important for you to understand that and correlate with what you see. So here you could see how we managed to use the technology that we have and actually draw out the whole uh, protic gland and its duct all the way to the front of the ductal opening, showing that extremely well. So Lauren's gone through to the level of the, uh, the neck, which I don't need to do that, that which, which is brilliant. And therefore you have to tally the anatomy to each side, to each level of the neck. Okay, and here you go where you have the separation A and B, which what Lawrence has shown you, the importance of level 2A and 2B, that is either it's anterior or behind the carotid artery, and level 3, which out the, without the division, 4, 5 is divided to 5A and 5B, and level 6, okay. So what do we have? I'm going to take you through the different level and what the anatomy you will see and what are the common pathology. So we're going to look at level one. So level one is underneath the jaw. So the big 
um, occupants in here is the jaw with teeth. So that could be dental causes that can cause lumps. Uh, don't forget that just because you're below the neck. You've got the sublingual gland, you've got the submandibular gland, you've got the tongue, which is a big structure in there. So we're going to look at that. Uh, okay, and level two, you're going into the protic gland. Again, you still got the teeth in the area, the mandible, the maxilla. You've got blood vessels coming through, the lymph net, lymph nodes, and the brachial apparatus. I'm sure you're familiar with this. So we have the, uh, the malohyoid, which separate the intraoral from the extraoral. So this is depicted by this slim muscle here. Okay, and then you have the two anterior belly of digastric, which is that, and I'm sure you know that already, but this is not what you see. Why is it upside down? Because your probe is going from superficial to deep. So all the structure is rotated. So this is what I call looking very much like a Mickey Mouse ear. So your anterior belly, your malohyoid, your genohyoid, your genoglossus, your sublingual gland, okay? So this is your intraoral, this is your extraoral. Again, here is the uh, structure and their names, so you can look through that. So this is a 40-year-old male presented with a lump in, in the mouth, in the floor of the mouth. And if you attended the lecture yesterday, uh, you will notice that this was what the presenter said. It was a renular, very, very typical appearance. So what did you see in a renula? So in the floor of the mouth, as you notice, the malohyoid depicts and separate the extraoral, which is the top here, and the intraoral. So this happened in the floor of the mouth. So in the floor of the mouth, the big gland here would be the sublingual gland, which is the smallest of the, all the major salivary glands. Okay, and so it sits here, and when that gets traumatized or damaged, that's how renula happens. So sometimes you'll see a collection here. So this is what renula is. Renula is benign. It may disappear by itself or it can be treated. Nowadays, it's very simple. Just putting a stitch in and it can disappear. Now, so this is another image of the renula sitting in the floor of the mouth. And this is using an intraoral probe. So that's your small hockey stick that you put in the floor of the mouth. So that will be the mucosal surface. And this is the renula cystic in appearance. So it's a leakage of saliva, normally from the septingal gland, caused by trauma. It's normally have a bluish transparent swelling in the floor. Now, it can also plunge below the malohyoid, therefore appearing on the other side in the extraoral into the submandibular space. So here you have the malohyoid. You could see the renula now plunge into the extraoral cavity. And here, as you can see on the MRI, so it, it appears in the submandibular space. This is called a plunging renula. It's benign. Again, here showing the 35-year-old uh, female with a lump underneath her mandible, and this is a plunging renula, okay? We're moving on. This is a young girl presented with a lump in the submental region. And here you put your probe there, and you could see, just see the edge of the right submental gland. And how you know that? Because of the annotation telling you exactly where you are. And here you got the structure that's filled with some fluid of some sort. So when you palpate this lump, it's soft, it's fluctuant. But on the ultrasound, it's showing you it's filled with fluid, but quite thick. Okay, as you could see here, it's avascular, there's no blood vessel in it. This is a dermoid cyst common in the second and third decade, equal in both men and female, very well defined. It's slow growing, uh, tend to be on the midline, it's suprahyoid, it's soft mobile mass. Okay, It can locate anywhere from the eyebrow down to the floor of the mouth and it can grow to quite a significant size. Now, in a case when you have a 69-year-old male with a large firm mass, and you can see it's not not very far off the thyroid, 
Okay, presented with large firm mass. Alarm bell should always ring on anybody that's older. So this is the Mickey Mouse uh, appearance that I show you, which is the normal for the flow of the mouth. Here you should have the malohyoid and here you should have the tongue. So you should have the genohyoid and the genioglossus. What do you see? There is no normal structure at all. You could see a big solid mass, a little bit like a huge, big, ill-defined mass in the thyroid with no boundaries. Okay, it's avascular. All right, what do you do next? Ignore it? You shouldn't. What you should do is ask the patient to open his mouth and have a look. And if there is a big lump raising the floor of the mouth, this is likely to be a, a tongue cancer. And here you could see we are at the submandibular gland, the malohyoid, this is the tongue. But I'm now lo you, um, looking more towards the uh, level two region. So I'm looking at this. So here we know it's the tongue. So we think, ah, oh, there is a lesion at the base of the tongue. Okay, and here looking again on that side, this is where the tonsil should sit and the base of the tongue. You have something irregular, very similar to the thyroid, anything irregular, enlarged and not looking normal, you must think of could it be cancerous, okay? So this is a base of tongue tumor, SCC seen in two different patients. We're moving on, so covering the level 1B where you have the submembered gland. Here you could see on the uh, MRI, just behind the sublingual gland. This is what you see on the ultrasound. So the malohyoid that's separate between intraoral and extraoral, at the end of this, at the end of the free end, is the submenable gland. Now the lovely bit about salivary gland, and if the fact that you've done thyroid, is the tissue, a normal salivary gland tissue, looks very similar to thyroid gland tissue. So, when they look like the thyroid tissue, they're normal. Okay, you expect that to be the gland. Here you have the subcutaneous fatty layer, and that's your skin. Now it abuts another kind of tissue very similar to this. This is the tail of the protein. So you're encroaching on level two here. Again, deeper to the malar hyoid, you have the tongue, and this is your hyoglossus muscle. Okay, so this is what you expect a normal right. At right level 1b to be. Now, if you suddenly look and you go, I can't see my tongue very well, it's been displaced. And your malohyoid been displaced as well, as well as the gland. When you have a huge collection here, there is something in the floor of the mouth. And the most common thing, a pathology in the floor of the mouth, is likely to come from teeth. Okay, we got 32 um, teeth in our mouth and each one of them can cause a problem. And if you ever see a collection like this, the first thing you, you will help the patient is by taking a what we call a dental panoramic view and uh, x-ray of the teeth basically. And here you could see there is a abscess at the roots of the teeth. Okay, and you think, oh, it's just a small abscess, it's not a problem. It is a problem when it's involved the flow of the mouth because what can happen is this can lead to something called liquid angina. This is the one thing that can actually kill the patient rather quickly because the name suggests angina and it can cause a choking sensation. It's an abscess that can constrict the airway. So it's a emergency and therefore you should not ignore this. If you don't take anything away today from me, remember, dental emergency can kill your patient. Again, you can have an abscess extending down the neck, and this is what abscess looks like. It's not well defined, it's uh, irregular, you can't find the border, and it tracks through the neck. And this one here, tracked from level two all the way to level four. And this is what abscess looks like. In this patient, we never found where it was coming from. It, it, he was admitted to hospital for several weeks for IV antibiotics. Let's move on. So the highest part of level two, you will hit a gland called the protic gland. 
Here, as you could see, is about the masseter muscle. Behind the mandible, here you could see the protic gland nice and smooth, just like your thyroid tissue, sitting and wrapping around the mandible. Abutting anterior to this is the masseter muscle. Behind this is your sternocleidal mastoid muscle and your posterior belly of digastric. So, salivary glands, we have three major pairs, protid subnubal gland and sublingual. Here you have the protid and there's always a duct that curves sort of superficial to the masseter, curve around it to pierce the buccinator into the oral cavity. The same with the submandibular uh, gland, there's always a ductal system that pierces through the malohyoid to come out in the floor of the mouth behind the, uh, the lower front teeth. The sublingual gland don't actually have a duct as such, not like the protid or the subnum gland, but it drains by numerous ducts called the ducts of Ramanus, and sometimes it does join up to the Wharton's duct. Then we have minor slimy glands, which are numerous in number, everywhere in the buccal mucosa in the mouth uh, to make your mouth nice and moist. So these are all the slimy gland disease, probably not everything, but some of the main ones that we encounter. Uh, we can have salivary gland obstruction, infection of the gland, silosis. We also can have systemic condition that affects the salivary gland, salivary cyst and salivary gland tumour. Uh, this was a, a paper we did many, many years ago where we look at what is the main cause of obstruction in salivary gland. And we found out the majority of it tend to be benign. 73% is due to stones in the gland. Okay, the stones in the slime glands are very similar to the stone you find in the kidney stones. Uh, so majority is caused by patients being dehydrated and not drinking sufficient fluid. You can also have uh, obstruction due to strictures, which mean narrowing of the ductal system. Okay, and also sometimes you have mucus plugs in there. And here, as you could see, this is a stone in the subnum gland uh, here in the genu. And here it's the left frotic gland and you could see a ductal dilatation. And when you have a ductal dilatation, you should always chase it to find what's wrong with the duct. And here is a narrowing, it's a stricture in the anterior ductal system before it enters the buccal mucosa. Right, back to our Mickey Mouse, which is the floor of the mouth. Okay, so this is the normal ultrasound picture. And this is something that you will, you may see. So look at this. Can you see what is abnormal? What is staring out at you? That is not on this one. I'll give you a second to have a look. Okay, so this is a sublingual gland sitting here. And here is a hypoechoic um, um, sort of region. So what is this? So whenever you see this, you need to see, is this something in the sublingual gland? Or is this a dilated duct? And this, in this case, was absolutely that, a dilated duct. The, the submittable duct and the protic duct, if it's normal, you would never see it. it. You only see it if it's pathological or if you've got a stone or you've got an obstruction. In here, if you follow this duct back, which is so dilated, you'll find a stone. This is what a stone looked like. It's calcified and you have a post-acoustic shadowing. And that's depict, it's calcified and therefore the ultrasound uh, signal cannot get through. And, and here we depict that's where it is in the right subnormal gland. And if you look closely, you could see how dilated that is. And then you could see the narrowing coming here, tapering down. There's a stricture right in front of that. Okay. And here you could see the obstruction. What do we do to prove what we see? Um, okay. So some. Uh, I'll get to, uh, to that in a minute. And here, when you look at something, there's something wrong with the gland, always check the other glands. You've got the other salivary gland. Look at them. Okay, this is the same patient. So this patient had a stone in the right side. They also have a stone on the left side. That's another stone. Okay, and we normally take a lower dental uh, occlusal, that's what we call them, and you could see that big stone sitting in the floor of the mouth. Again, here 
you could see that. So very simple x-ray to prove that. This is another patient who presented with a small stone. And this is how we, we get them out. We use the same basket to retrieve, which is used in, in to retrieve kidney stones. We use it into the ductal system, retrieve the stone. And uh, here, this patient had three stones, and the three stone came out quite easily. That, this is the same patient that you have with a big massive stone on both sides of the gland. Always look at the other gland, as I said, and here you have heterogeneous changes on both of the protic glands, and yet they have no stone. So, listen on and we'll find out why. Here, you can have the stone in the subnormal gland, which is more common. You can also have a stone in the protic gland, which is less common, but stone can exist in the protic gland. So, Every time you see a dilated duct, follow the duct. See if you could see anything with shadowing that suggests a stone. Here, there is a stone in there, and you could see the duct coming over the masseter. Okay, and here you've got a very long accessory loop of the protic gland. That's a normal variant. To find out how stricture, uh, how strict the the duct is, we perform something called a silogram. We put the contrast into the ductal system and you could see here where it is so tight it caused further ballooning of the posterior part of that duct huge balloon okay and this will cause the patient to have a problem so the one question we ask them is when you have your meal does your face swell up and they will say oh yes it swell up quite a lot and this is why because the duct is strictured here uh, sometimes you will see, uh, when you look, this is the floor of the mouth, sometimes you see the sublingual gland being bigger than it should and perforating through the uh, malohyoid, as you could see here. Okay, This we call a malohyoid boutonnier. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, boutonnier means a button. And it's absolutely a normal uh, variant of anatomy. Okay. Here, the next one, I'm going to show you a five-year-old girl who presented with recurrent painful swelling of the right protic gland. Uh, for a year, she has no other symptom in the other gland. So this is the protic gland. And as you remember, the protic should look like the thyroid when they're normal, nice and smooth. They're not. So these are multiple foci in both the right and left protic. And she has no symptom on the left. And here on the right, you can see they're hypoequic with loads of hyperequic specks within them. Okay, this is this infection in the gland. She has, and, and when we do a cytogram, you see um, uh, cytolactasis. This is globular cytolactasis in the gland. And this is uh, what we call a recurrent parotitis of childhood. Uh, it's uh, also known as juvenile parotitis. There's no treatment for this. Uh, it's benign and they will grow out. And some of them, they don't, and some of them became, can become Sjogren's uh, later on in life. Now, this is also very common. I probably see one or two of these patients. I, I had four patients today with bilateral swelling of the protic gland. Very, very common. Either the protic, all of the glands, or subnubal gland, as you could see in this lady. And if you remember back to your thyroid tissue, they look absolutely normal. There's nothing wrong with the tissue but they are just so large. This is what we call silosis, okay? Silosis means it's non-inflammatory, diffuse larvae gland enlargement with or without excess elevation. Patients don't complain they produce a lot of saliva. Some of them don't even know they have it. The only problem why they come is because they have really huge uh, face looking like that. And when do we see silosis? It's normally in patients who doesn't know that they have diabetes. So in the undiagnosed diabetic patient or in those who have diabetes but poorly controlled. They are also common in patients who, who may have liver problems. Today, I had a patient who takes 40 units of alcohol a week and he has silosis. And in the other uh, spectrum is patient with bulimia nervosa they can also present with silosis. This is a patient in Shogun's. In Shogun's patient, they presented with very dry mouth and eyes. Okay, it was first reported by the Swedish ophthalmologist in 1933. 
It affected 1-3% to of the UK population, majority in the middle age female. And it's one of the second most commonest autoimmune connective tissue. What do we see on ultrasound? It goes from mild to evident to gross changes. So you see soap, um, uh, honeycomb-like appearance. This is heterogeneous honeycomb-like appearance to prominent gross-like appearance of the slurry glands. It can affect one gland. It can affect all the glands. It can also produce what we call a punctate stalactasis when you do a sinogram and and the um, complication of this is they can develop into what we call a solid tumor and this is commonly seen in mild lymphoma okay not everyone with Sjogren's will be will have mild lymphoma but those who presented with evident gross changes and we have a uh, we have a few patients now coming through. They have Sjogren's early in life. Remember what I said about the juvenile prototitis? Very early in life, they are developing, mal they can develop mild lymphoma, and therefore we see them quite regularly on a yearly review. Right, this is a young man. He was 24, and he says, I suddenly presented with um, chubby cheek for the last uh, two weeks. Okay, he otherwise has no symptoms. So, we look at the ultrasound and he presented with really bulky parotid gland, bulky subnode gland. And what he didn't know was he also had a bulky lacrimal gland. You could see the heterogeneous changes throughout these glands. His lymph nodes are up, but they have got a hilum. Oval in shape, they're not hugely enlarged, but there are numerous of them in bilateral neck. Can you think what he, he has? Yes, he has sarcoidosis. This is what sarcoid looked like. So, when you see a salivary gland that looking like Sjogren's or sarcoid, they could be of different pathology. They can also be HIV. HIV can present in, can present in different stage. You can have changes mildly like this, or they can present it with a benign lymphoepithelial numerous of them. They could be in... Majority, I see them in protic gland, but they can be in any of the slimy gland. And recently, also remember, they can these changes can also be seen in lupus and also in IgG4 patient. Okay, what is IgG4? You probably have heard of it. They are multi-organ uh, pathology. There are numerous, too numerous for me to mention here, but I'm sure you know all about it. And how do they present? This is a patient that came in because they have enlarged lacrimal gland. And you can see changes within the protic, very, very subtle in the protic gland and also uh, here uh, in the subnub glands. Okay. And to diagnose IgG4 is very difficult. It's not all about getting a high level of IgG4. Some of them are just above uh, normal, okay? And it's very, very important to actually uh, biopsy them. And one way to do it is a core biopsy sometimes help. The next one is fairly uh, new. We came across this not very long ago, but it has been in the literature as well back as about 100, 200 years ago. And basically, patients present with a very, very itchy salivary gland. And if you do a sali, uh, if you do a salogram, they look like they have uh, saladenitis. And they can present with stone and strictures. And sometimes this can affect all the major salivary glands. And this is called allergic eosinophilic salodicitis. Um, we treat them with a very high dose of um, uh, antihistamine, and that appears to control them. But they do have do need regular washout of the slime gland tissue of the slimy ductal system. Sometimes, when you scan the protic gland, you come across cysts. They can be fluid-filled cysts with saliva, as you could see here. This is known as silocele. They are benign. You can drain them, but they can come back. We're going to touch on slime gland tumor. 
they represent two to three percent of all the head and neck tumors. Okay, the smaller the gland, the higher chance of malignancy. So if you see them in the protic gland, the likelihood that 70% and 80% of them tend to be benign. The smaller the gland you go to, towards the other end, the sublingual gland, the chances majority will probably be more malignant than benign. Okay? So you have the primary uh, slime gland tumour. You can also have the secondary, the metastatic spread of tumour into the gland. All right. So these are the... The, the simple rule, 80% of the slavic tumour tend to be found in the protic gland. 80% of them tend to be in the superficial lobe. 80% of the protic tumours tend to be benign. And 80% of the benign tumours tend to be pleomorphic adenoma. So really simple 80% rule. Okay, So this is what pleomorphic adenoma look like. They're, they're solid, they're well-defined, they tend to be, uh, you can see them lobulated. Okay. And this you see in a, um, I'm going to present you a case that is very rare. A 68-year-old 68 68-year-old female presented with lesions in both the protic, the thyroid gland, and her liver. It came to light because her the, the, the lesion in the liver was biopsied. And then they go, yep, we found pleomorphic adenoma in the liver. And therefore, when we scan her thyroid, we found this lesion. As you could see, it's tall rather than wide, irregular, lobulated, okay, solid, and that will be a U uh, a U thyroid five. And then we look at the protic gland; looks very similar, okay, to the thyroid, and we FNA both, and this confirm it's exactly identical to the liver. It's a pleomorphic adenoma. So it's very rare to have a metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma seen in less than 1%. 50 cases reported worldwide. None of these 50% was ever metastasized to, to the liver. So we reported the first case, and this we saw them in 2015. This is a cystic lesion. You could see multi-cystic compartment in a 75-year-old male with a three-month history of swelling. He's a smoker. Okay, and we did aspirate him, and this is the color of the fluid that came out. This is what he was like before, and this was after. The next common thing that's common, that's benign in the protic gland, in the slime glands, are Wharton's tumor. Okay, and this is to tell you different shape. Majority of the Wharton's tend to be cystic, and they tend to be in smokers. When they are very small, they are very difficult to differentiate between pleomorphic and Wharton's. The other lot of slime gland tumour tends to be the neoplastic group. You can have base lot, myoepithelial or oncocytic uh, neoplasm. Again, there are tumours in the slimy glands. Uh, and it's difficult to differentiate sometimes from the malignant uh, group. And therefore, it's really, really important to FNA them if you found them. This is another kind. This is called... Believe it or not, a chronic sclerosing saladenitis. It's very firm to palpation. They tend to be in the anterior part of the subnum gland. It's for some reason called a cutna tumor, but it's not a tumor. It's benign. Okay, it tend to be firm, and if you FNA them, they tend to be non-diagnostic. Now, if you scan a subnum gland and they don't look like this, and what you see is they look as though they're feathering to the skin and completely solid and irregular and speculated in every direction. This is tumor and to prove it otherwise, as you could see here how much it feather on that MRI scan. And this was an SCC of the uh, um, submenopic gland. Lawrence has beautifully described the lymph node. It should be oval in shape with a hilum. And guess what? In the protic gland, there are lymph nodes to be found. There are no lymph nodes in the subnormal gland. So whatever pathology in the lymph nodes, this can come to the protic gland, to the slurry, to the protic gland. Here you could see this patient presented with a lump just behind the ear here. So when you scan the patient, you see a solid looking lesion. 
Okay, you could see here, oh, there's fast clarity in it. Could it be in a node? And this was a couple months later. This is what happened to that node. And this is TB. Okay, again, if you see something similar in the neck that is solid, completely necrotic looking, and this was a 28 year old female who works in a microbiology lab, she also has TB. Okay. It's, co it's common, 10 million worldwide. A lot of places are no longer vaccinated, no longer giving you BCG. And these are the groups are at risk, as you already know. The secondary mats from elsewhere can also end up in the lymph nodes in the protic gland. This is one seen from the breast, another one from melanoma, and this was one seen uh, from an SCC, which was from a right eyelid, okay? If the lymph nodes look a bit enlarged, abnormal looking, the hilum is thickened and abnormal, and uh, solid mass looking like this, they're worth F an FNA to confirm the diagnosis. Again here, a lymph node avascular, this is a follicular lymphoma. This is another one, a non-Hodgkin mental cell lymphoma. So they can be in the protic gland. Okay. Now, remember I said, in this area, you also have teeth. You also have the jaw. You have the mandible. You have the maxilla. This was a 12-year-old boy who presented with a swelling to his face. No pain, no history of trauma. He had a dental x-ray. Looking for pathology, we can't see much. But when you put the ultrasound on, this is the mandible, this is the masseter, something is lifting it up from the mandible itself. Looks like there is a collection in here. It's an abscess. Where could it come from? So we couldn't see much on the x-ray, and this is what we call a cone beam CT. It's a, it's a, a brilliant um, uh, uh cone beam where it's reduced radiation to a child. It's like a CT and it's very good for looking at dental pathology. And here you could see onion peel, which is uh, the cause of his swelling. It's osteomyelitis of the left mandible presented as an abscess to that side of the mandible. So we're going on to level two here. And as, as you could see in the previous talk, how do we know we are in level two, is any structure above the bifurcation of the carotid artery, okay? So you have the subnormal gland in front of it, the sternocleidomastoid behind it, and it has to be above the bifurcation of the carotid. So here, this patient presented with a swelling in the left level two. And what do you find? It's a cystic lesion. It has debris, thickened fluid on the inside. It's anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. It's avascular, okay? Oh, CT has been taken. It's situated behind the subnormal gland. Here, similarly, seen in a female, again in the right level two, here with an MRI, again behind the subnormal gland in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and we drain it. Oh, it looks look really pus-like, okay? And this... Oh, oh, this is our on-site uh, 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 cytology. Here you could see how a, a slide is being prepared. So I'm just showing you what we do in our clinic. This is called the Rapid Access One Stop Clinic uh, for Rapid Assessment, or Rose, surprisingly, my name. And uh, we stain it straight away. And uh, this is the ultrasound room. So we stain it uh, outside the ultrasound room. And we have a biomedical scientist looking at it. So if we don't have enough cells, we go straight back to the patient and we get more cells okay so it's on site and it's done within a matter of minutes so what is the most likely in that uh, swelling that you have both of them have what is called a brachioclepsis It's very very common in the level two the second brachioclef there's four of them the second brachioclef is the most common 95 percent it accounts for 95 percent of all the brachioclef Okay, common, 10 to uh, 40 years old, equal amount in both male and female. 
and where do you find it? There's a track that comes from the uh, tonsillar uh, uh, fauces all the way anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, all the way down to the supraclavicular neck. So it can be anywhere along this, this line. Okay, now, the other thing that you don't take away from this talk, except the lupic angina and this one, remember, if this is no longer in a young patient, it's in a old male, anyone above the age of 30, if they presented with what looks like a brachoplasis, okay, look at this lesion, very similar to those two, do a PET scan because it's hot on pat and you're looking for a primary. The primary is the tonsillar bed, okay? So ask yourself, how common is a brachoclepsis in an older patient? It's not, right? This is another patient. And here, when we, uh, we perform an FNA, if we don't get enough cell or we need more cell and we want proof, we can do a core biopsy. And what is really helpful since COVID is to avoid GA. We do a core biopsy to test for HBV testing. And that's help in the staging of the patient and their management. This was a slide that a colleague gave me. And you could see um, the incident of SEC in the lateral upper neck compartment. It rises from the age of 30 upwards surprisingly drop after the age of 60, okay? And here I'm going to show you a case of an 80-year-old female with a similar appearance, what looks like a cyst on the neck, and we go, oh, 82, pet positive. It must be a mat, okay? It was a false positive. She, when we FNA, and this was removed, was the second break of cleft. She was the oldest patient we ever had, but it's rare, okay? So anyone above the age of 31, beware. All right. So other break of classes, very briefly, they all look the same. It depends where they are. Here is a third break of classes, and this one comes from the hypopharynx all the way, tracking behind the carotid, uh, 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 common carotid, all the way down to the timers, okay? Here, you could see this one here is actually in the thyroid. So yes, you can have a brachoclepsis in the thyroid. Which one? It's the fourth brachoclepsis, all right? And this one is a similar one. Where does it come from? The tract comes from the hypopharynx into the left uh, thyroid, as you could see here, okay? And this is the fourth brachoclef, so it can happen. What about mass by the carotid uh, bifurcation? So here you could have, you see the carotid bifurcation, it's dividing and you can, it's displaying the carotid bifurcation, the mass sitting here. It's easily seen on an MRI. You could see this is normal site. You could see how that mass caused a display of the internal and external carotid artery. And here, as you could see this, you listened to the speaker yesterday and, she, and he says it's very uh, pattern mnemonic on an MRI. It, it comes out like a pepper uh, appearance. This is a carotid body tumor, a paraganglioma. This is the one lesion you do not want to FNA, okay? What about level three, four, and five? What do you find? Again, remember just now we talk about the brachial apparatus. You can have nerves, you have, can have lymph node, you can have all the other lumps, okay? Uh, here you have the common carotid, as you could see there, the IJV, remember what Lauren says? The omohyoid is going to swing around and when it crosses the IJV, that's when you're going to go into level four, okay? So what can we see here? So this was a, here we could see a collection, a cystic collection of fluid of some sort, all right? It can be anywhere. This is a lymphangioma, it's benign. It's a fluid-filled cavity. If you drain it, it can fill it back up again. This was a 40-year-old patient who had a hemipyridectomy because of a PTC to the right protein, presented with a lump. And we thought, oh, right, this, she's probably got a metastasis on the right level three. Put the needle in and she jumped. Extremely painful, okay? 
let's tell you it has nerve in origin. This turned out to be a schwannoma. Okay. And here you have a cystic appearance, all right? And here you have a solid, the same patient, all right? This was a metastatic lesion from the lung. So it can go as high up at level two. This was exactly in the same patient on the opposite side, okay? Right and left. So we're going down level six. You know this level very well. This is where the thyroid sits. I'm not going to lecture you about the thyroid, but here we go. Right up to the top by the hyoid. When you see fluid looking like that, remember if you go a bit higher, it could be the dermoid. You come a bit down by the hyoid. This is a, well, that's the aspiration of the fluid, a thyroglossoduxus. So thyro, um, thyroglossoduxus arises from the, uh, the, the foramen cecum all the way down. It's important to depict the relationship to the hyoid bone. Is it superior? Is it uh, tightly related to it? Is it inferior? Is it, um, uh, you know, has any relationship to the hyoid? Because that's important for the surgeon when they come to remove it. Do they need, need to remove a portion of the hyoid bone? Thyroglossoduxus, if you leave a remnant behind, can cause problem and I see recurrences and problems to the patient from time to time. Okay, they also presented with one percent risk of, uh, as you know, PTC or cancer. Right, so not very far off the thyroid. If you go a bit up, you hit the larynx. If you ever see a hypochic solid or non-solid mass up here, be careful. This could be a tumor sitting in the larynx. This is the same patient as the ultrasound. This is the MRI. And you could see that tumor sitting within that larynx. Okay. Now, this was, um, this was last week. This was a patient presented with a cystic lesion in left level four. Uh, on MRI here, we aspirated what looks like a milk color fluid. Okay, Looking closely on the MRI, you could see that's a cystic lesion. And then you could see this tract going into the lymphatic system. Okay, this is a lymphocele. Uh, this a lymphocele is described as atypical collection of lymphatic fluid with no epithelial lining. She has no trauma. She has no previous surgery. This is a lymphocele. Okay, what about blood vessel? So remember your your carotid artery sitting there next to your thyroid gland, beside lateral to the carotid artery, the common carotid is your IJV, and your IJV should be nice and hypoquic with good flow within it. However, if you find that there's something in your IJV, turn your probe around, and if it's solid looking like this, this is a thrombosis within the IJV, okay? And you must always, it's, it, you sh it's an urgent thing, and you should always tell whoever refer you the patient that they got a clot in the IJV. This is thrombosis. Okay. Again, here you could see the solid component within the IJV. Okay. And here you could see there again, the longitudinally. This is common. You will see a traumatous plaque within the carotid, and you want to see a beautiful flow uh, to make sure that there's no obstruction. Right. This is a case of, um, I saw this patient today. He presented with, you could see that, you could not see any normal structure of the neck at all. It's all heterogeneous and you see loads of calcification and you think, oh, is this a salivary stone in the subnerval gland? But where is the gland? There is no gland, okay? It's completely heterogeneous, completely, there's, there's sort of, abnormal sort of looking vas vas vascularity. Then looking at the MRI, you could see, and this was also been done today, and you could see it's, it's, it's like, it's, you know, it's taking up contrast, quite a lot of it. And amazingly, what the dental x-ray is showing, loads of calcification. This is what we call, this is looking at the floor of the mouth, numerous calcification. This is phleboliths. Phleboliths occurs uh, because of calcification in a very low flow blood vessel. Okay, this is a venous malformation. What other common lumps that we find? So you could see this patient coming with a double chin. 
Actually, the, the last venous malformation I show you, he presented something like this. So this patient presented with a lump. Looks like a double chin. This patient presented with lump on the side, nice and soft. And here you could see uh, a bulky cheek on one side. And if you do the ultrasound, this is what they look like. Hypoquick with horizontal striation. If you see a horizontal striation, they're nice and soft to palpate. This is a lipoma. And you could see here, confirm on the MRI as a, as a fatty cell, uh, fat, uh, fat, fat lesion. So lipoma is very, very common. Okay, I probably see that almost every day in, in our patient. Uh, common in the fifth and sixth decade, more so in male than female. It's just matured adipose tissue. All right. So the other thing you could have is epidermoid cysts or sebaceous cysts. Okay. They're just full of keratin. Uh, they can arise from a uh, hair follicle. And if you aspirate them, they, they, they feel like cheesy, like oily material and smell terribly. Okay. The other uh, syndrome that you, if they have numerous of these uh, sebaceous cysts or epidermoid cysts are Gollin syndrome. Uh, and we had a patient, one with Gollin syndrome, and uh, they can have loads of basal cell, and those can be quite aggressive, and they can appear in uh, sites that are not exposed to the sun. Okay. Right, so in summary, Incident defining is very common, and ultrasound is a very useful tool. It's so simple. You already scan the thyroid, you can scan these at the neck. Uh, important to note where they are uh, and what you see. Describe them. Important not to miss a mass that could be malignant. Beware of those lesions in left level two, okay? The cystic one or the necrotic looking one. Uh, where there's a mass of concern, FNA is useful. And you can do it. If you do it to the thyroid, you can do it to the slump. But don't do it to the uh, carotid body tumor. Remember, if you don't know what they are, your radiologists are your friends. Talk to them. We are very happy to help you. You're not alone. Any question, uh, please ask, or you can always email me. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. It brought me down uh, and uh, learned me that uh, we cannot replace radiologists. Okay, we can experts in thyroid ultrasound and in parathyroid and, and some aspects of lymph nodes, but without a radiologist, uh, a clinician and endocrinologist uh, uh, cannot produce the same level of work. So it, it, it was it was very nice and, and very edifying. Questions? Thank you. I stand them all. <laughs> okay. uh, one, one simple Congratulations, uh, Rose. <laughs> thank Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hostile. Yeah. Kadın Lafmonti Darcy Hani, hatırlıyor musun? I think this microphone remained on. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, please unmute yourself uh, if somebody has uh, questions. I have a practical one, uh, and, and it seems to be a na naive uh, question, but uh, in a tertiary care unit, in a university level, uh, I know that uh, there must be a radiologist with uh, skill enough uh, uh, to, uh, to handle this uh, issue, this, this neck ultrasound. But is this in primary or secondary level also? For example, in the UK? Um, we have, because there's, there's, there's lack of radiologists in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what the number is, but it's quite significant. And it proved to us during COVID how, how, how 
how little of radiologists we have. Um, so we have this system, the way we work, um, I specialize in head and neck. We have a whole team of people who we call sonographers. So they train in general ultrasound. So they screen all the primary patient that comes from GPs because we could not handle that. Um, so they, they, they are our workhorse. They are so important to us. They, they do all the basic scanning, all the lumps and bumps. So once they, they said, yes, there is actually a lump, they then get sent to the specific clinic, um, you know, be it musculoskeletal or head and neck or uh, thyroid or, you know. So, so that's where we come in and where we do the FNA. So now in, in the UK, like my institution, from the point of referral to the point of diagnosis is 11 days. You've got 11 days to diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And therefore, having the one stop with the cytologist on board, with the consultant there, it's completely changed the ball game because we could not do this 11 days. Uh, you know, before we take a sample, it would take approximately two weeks to know the results. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's even before you have MDM discussion <laughs> or, okay. or whether they need other imaging. So, yes. Okay. So, yes, we, we have to have a team of people. So if anybody wants to work in the UK, please come. We, I'm sure there's so many spaces available. <laughs> okay. Okay. Other questions? This on-site cytology has a great uh, impact in the thyroid because uh, the thyroid belongs to those uh, fields of uh, cytology when uh, the non-diagnostic reports are quite high. So uh, uh, one possible uh, solution is that uh, a clinician uh, makes a rapid uh, uh, staining, quick dip or gimza staining, it requires two or three minutes uh, uh, to get result and naturally we, uh, it is not uh, weighted to give a clinic, uh, cytological diagnosis but it is enough uh, to reveal whether the uh, aspiration was uh, non-diagnostic or not. We have, you see on my slide, so uh, we have what we call the biomedical scientists, so they're technician. They are trained to make sure that they can find those uh, cells on our slides. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have six group of cells, it's non-diagnostic. Yes. Uh, so they are quite helpful because we can train many of them. So they come to various clinic, and then we have specific clinic where we have diff uh, when when we have non-diagnostic sample, then we have the pathologist being there. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the way to go. Train technician up uh, to help you on clinic, mm -hmm. and. If you do a specific clinic, then it's it's quite use. You know, like I have an FNA clinic, and it's all FNAs. Mm -hmm. So you know, every single patient on that day needs an FNA, and okay. it's very good use of time mm -hmm. to have that. Yes. And I would encourage if if you have the resources, go for it. Okay. Please put your questions. May I ask a question, please? Please. Yeah, please. Uh, thanks uh, for both excellent presentations. I would like to ask the both presenters if they have any information. I don't know. It's regarding the EGG, IgG4 related disease. I mean, uh, is there any specific? Uh, presentation of the disease in the thyroid is it explainable i don't know as well it's uh, because it's very difficult to diagnose um thank you lawrence i'll, I'll let you answer this one <laughs> lawrence not sure if Lawrence is Lawrence, there. if you are here, please unmute yourself. I didn't hear the question, okay. sorry. Lawrence, the question is um, IgG4 in the thyroid. What is your experience? And how, how you diagnose it? Which one? 
IgG4 disease. IgG4, I don't understand, sorry. Okay, so, um, so from my point of view, IgG4 is, is it's been a while, but not many people know about it. And it presents uh, in multi, let me just go back. I can try to also share with you a paper maybe later on through Thomas, and he can um, share it with you. Hang on, let me just go back. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the slide. There we go. So it's multi-compartment. The way I see it is a lot of patients presented with uh, firm salary glands. I think I have only one case uh, of the thyroid, if I remember right. But even then, they didn't come because of the thyroid. They came because of the salary gland. And... Uh, their symptom is very vague, extremely vague. Um, so from my point of view, I hardly some some of them will have a raised IgG4, and the main reason why they come is for the core biopsy, and we always diagnose it mostly on the core biopsy, not on FNA, not on anything else. Uh, Lawrence, do you, perhaps yeah. you can share. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you you mean uh, rhidal sarditis? No, no. Yeah. It's, it's a, a disease called IgG4. They have a... a um, not experienced in, in this pathology. It's more from the rheumatology point of view. Because yes, most of the um, patient presents no it to them. Sorry. So you could see here, they they uh, on this slide, they they can present with numerous, including rhinothyroiditis, apparently, but I've not seen one uh, uh, with, with IgG4. Uh, these are numerous, but I presume you can always test them um, for IgG4. But ours has never come back positive for IgG4. I know in Japan, there's a lot of patients in Japan with IgG4, but I've got limited knowledge. Thomas, do you have any? No, I have no experience uh, with this one. Maybe I uh, did not think about this uh, possibility. Uh, I, I have no, no, no one patient which I have diagnosed uh, in my thyroid clinic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a patient um, in Hungary having um, IgG4 related uh, hypophysitis. So, but um, he never developed fear. He's um, um, he's basically in a, in a clinic since ten years, but never developed another other gland uh, which was involved with IgG4. Only the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, she. He was the first case ever having IgG4 uh, related uh, hypophysitis, uh, developing a diabetes insipidus, and um, basically pan um pituitarism, but never be um, developed thyroid disease. I mean, um, during these ten years. It's true, um, and uh, some of them just develop one part and not other glands. Um, and, and therefore now, when we have awake uh, symptoms in patients and we're not sure, we test them uh, for IgG4. Very good question. Thank you. Okay. Anyone a comment? Um, may I ask? May I? Yes, please. A comment? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if, if if I am right, but uh, I I have a anecdotic case because when I was uh, making a thyroid ultrasound to one patient, I find uh, a thyroiditis autoimmune autoimmunity in the thyroid. And a classical change in in the ultrasound, but uh, I don't know why I I start to examine the the traveling world gland 
Um, I find the same characteristic uh, in the ultrasound as the thyroid and as the subglandular uh, one. Uh, but the patient has thyroiditis autoimmune, but the gland, I don't know why, why the patient has the, this characteristic and, and um, the cohen. I think um, from what my experience is, that's why if you scan the thyroid and you're quite used to the glandular texture, the saliva gland is very similar. And sometimes when you see, it doesn't mean that when the patient has an autoimmune condition in the thyroid, you will see it in the salivary gland or vice versa. But sometimes you can, because some patients with children do present it do present with Hashimoto's, not all the patients do, not 100% of them, some do, not the majority. So it's worth looking both sides. And I think it's probably going to be similar with IgG4. Some of them will be present will present in the slide gland. Some may or may not present in the thyroid. Uh, as I said, I, I have very limited experience. We haven't had many. And the one we have hasn't had, you know, probably just one of them had it in the thyroid. But again, very, very vague, very heterogeneous and nothing else. So sometimes I, I feel when you look at your thyroid and you want to know whether your thyroid is normal and your salivary glands are normal, compare the texture. I sometimes do that all the time. So, you know, it can be very helpful. Okay. okay. You. You're very welcome. Other questions to Rose or to Laurence? It's okay for me. Wonderful uh, talk, uh, Rose. And, and yours, because it's so nice to hear the level of the neck, how it came about, you know, how we got to this stage, how it got divided, how it's so important to, to know the location, because when you're mapping out, you've got to make sure you are mapping out to the right place. Absolutely very important. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we close our today event and thank you very much for our two uh, speakers, to Laurence Lenhart and to Rose Gu and uh, also to the participants. Uh, we will meet uh, uh, in a webinar in the end of March. See the curriculum on the website. Thank you very much again for your participation. Have a good night. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Thomas. Have a lovely evening.